kind of presentation of an ongoing project uh, which is linked across the top there, uh, indicated across the top there. It's called Y Mobility. Um, this is a Horizon 2020 large scale project which Sussex is a, a partner in. Uh, and it's about youth mobility in Europe. We're about one year through this three year project, so it's really kind of preliminary. And when my co author Ayulule saw the announcement for this, uh, this, this workshop today, she said, Yes, we must. Uh, present there and she kind of designed a PowerPoint which I'm going to show you and then she discovered that she had a, a clash with another conference in, in Norway um, so she sent me along as a kind of uh, a poor substitute um, so sorry for those of you who are looking forward to meeting her uh, I'm afraid you'll have to do with me okay um, this is the uh, outline of uh, our presentation um, it's uh, as I said before, set within this um, new uh, project called Y Mobility, <coughs> which is a kind of play on words. If you haven't got the joke, it's, you know, Y stands for youth, but also Y Mobility. Why are people, uh, why are people uh, mobile? Um, so I, I sketch through uh, quickly a theoretical framework and methods, and then uh, most of the presentation will be hopefully devoted to analyzing some of the, uh, the transcripts. I mean, we're still very much at the data collection stage. And as I say, this is the, pretty much the first attempt to kind of share some very preliminary results. Uh, but of course, the issue of Brexit did uh, surface um, in the transcripts, uh, in the interviews. The, 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 the research is not specifically focused on, on, on Brexit, of course. It's focused much more generally on youth transitions as they intersect with spatial youth mobility within uh, within within Europe, uh, and when we first started the interviews back in the autumn of last year, of course Brexit or the, the referendum was rather distantly present on the horizon. Um, so it's only in the more recent transcripts, only in the more, more recent interviews, that uh, the, these issues of of, um, of the referendum have have surfaced uh, rather rather prominently. Okay, so this is just a, a quick. Uh, uh, outline of uh, the wider research project. It's, it's about intra-European geographical mobility in, in nine countries, three countries which are predominantly receiving countries, the UK, Germany and Sweden, three countries which are predominantly sending countries for youth, young migrants, Romania, Slovakia and Latvia, and three countries which are involved in both kind of sending and receiving, Ireland, Spain and, uh, and, and Italy, although obviously the balance uh, shifts uh, somewhat between uh, those, those in, in and out movements. Um, and at Sussex we're responsible, basically our work package is to uh, 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 do the, the interviews for six groups uh, in the, the wider London region. So we have collected, or we're in the process of collecting, but it's nearly finished. Uh, 20 interviews from each of those three, each of those six uh, national groups, and what I'm going to concentrate today is, is mainly on the Latvian, Slovakian, and Romanian case, and in fact mainly on the Latvian case because my co-author um, Aya did the Latvian interviews herself, and so uh, that's where most of the preliminary analysis has come from. And we divide mobile youth into uh, three categories: students, and then a rather crude. Def, uh, distinction um, between higher skilled and lower skilled based on the uh, on whether there's a, 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 a university graduate education uh, or, or not but of course we recognize that that's a very crude distinction and I could spend five or ten minutes problematizing that distinction and I've written about it but uh, just uh, just let me leave that uh, by the by the side and the two uh, theoretical ideas that we bring to this uh, this paper this a very embryo embryonic paper. Uh, firstly, the notion of liquid migration, which obviously owes, uh, owes its heritage to, to Bauman and his uh, liquid life and uh, liquid love and liquid modernity and liquid anything you want. Well, we've got liquid migration here because it seems to us to encapsulate the character of this sort of free movement, free, free mobility within, uh, particularly within the post-2004 uh, uh, EU. Um, and again, I could spend more time discussing it, but I think the key phrase which, which sort of encapsulates this notion of liquid migration is intentional unpredictability, the notion that people can leave with an open-ended agenda. They're not migrating 
you know, with a necessarily with a specific regime or structure or target uh, in mind. You know, they're not aiming necessarily to settle. Uh, they're not involved necessarily in, 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 in kind of guest worker type migration with a particular fixed contract or whatever. Um, it's, it's this kind of intentional open-endedness which is uh, the defining characteristic of liquid migration. And the second theoretical notion that we bring to bear um, on this research is, and which is particularly relevant to the Brexit uh, issue, uh, are what we call tactics of belonging. So this um, is a, a notion which comes from a, a variety of authors uh, in, in terms of its, of it, of its uh, sourcing, um, but it's, it's basically the way in which uh, Eastern European migrants, who are the groups that I'm, I'm henceforth uh, concerned with, the Latvians, the Slovakians and the, and the Romanians, are obviously left in nearly all cases politically voiceless about a topic, uh, an issue which is fundamentally affecting them and of which they are in many cases the target of anti European immigrant re rhetoric. Um, so how do they engage with the political issues and expectations uh, for this uh, upcoming referendum and how does it affect their kind of everyday lives and their everyday uh, discourses? Um, and the, the, the tactics that we, we want to sort of explore in a bit more detail, um, which I, I think are, are, are uh, spelled out, no actually they're on the, the, the previous slide, are, are basically threefold. It, it's, it's about discussing um, sort of everyday notions of, of, of their understanding of the evolving political situation. It's also about them stressing their own role as good migrants, if I can pick up Simone's idea, as deserving migrants, therefore stressing their value to the British economy in terms of uh, work and, and tax paying and so on. And there's also a citizenship dimension, the extent to which they are thinking forward by uh, exploiting dual nationality options if they have them or longer term citizenship or uh, a shorter term uh, uh, option through, uh, through other sort of residence, uh, residence possibilities. So this basically is the research puzzle which I kind of sketched out uh, already in what I've just said. Uh, the two main research questions are how do young Eastern European migrants construct their political responses against the backdrop of the Brexit debate uh, and what do they think about their future migration and belonging to Britain in this changing discursive landscape that is surrounding uh, the whole uh, Brexit uh, issue. So the, the methods uh, are basically uh, uh, what I introduced very briefly at the beginning. We've interviewed uh, with uh, appropriate interviewers. Uh, Aya has interviewed the Latvians. Uh, Veronica, who's a, a, a master's student at Sussex, uh, has interviewed the Slovakians and Alexandra who's a master's student at Cambridge has interviewed the Romanians so these were interviews carried out in the, uh, the native languages of the uh, interviewees uh, and we uh, sort of interrogate the transcripts for references to, uh, to, to Brexit and then towards the end of the interview process as, as Brexit became more of a, of a, of a, of a, um, you know, a, a fixed date um, then that question obviously surfaced uh, more and more. Uh, we also have a second uh, methodology which Aya is working on but um, for time reasons we haven't got very far with that yet and uh, I'm not going to say more about that. So moving in now to the analysis part of uh, the presentation. So the first aspect is just to kind of demonstrate through a couple of case studies, very brief case studies, <laughs> this notion of liquid migration of how people are moving freely not just back and forth between necessarily an origin and a, and a destination, but how, you know, for many migrants who end up in the London area, there's a history of moving to other places as well, and an optionality of moving to other places, perhaps after, after leaving London. So here we have uh, Alex, a, a, a young Romanian, uh, highly educated, but in a lower skilled job, working mainly in construction. Uh, and so I'm not going to read the, 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 the whole quote out, but you can see how he um, sort of bounces around through Switzerland and France and Germany uh, doing various jobs uh, and then ends up uh, in, 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 in London. And, and for him it's kind of quite casual. He says, you know, just like that I changed from one country uh, to the other. And then I've highlighted another part of the quote. The idea of knowing a new country to visit a new country, you know, this is what uh, this is what uh, sort of drove uh, me. So there's one type of um, 
illustration of this notion of liquid migration coming from the, the more lower skilled uh, category. Um, and then uh, another one, another example uh, about the future. One of our research questions was, was about imagining the future. Um, and so in this particular case, Gunita, uh, a young Latvian, again, lower, lower qualified, but actually very ambitious, as you can see from her quote. Uh, she envisages her future as some kind of international business person wanting to travel, uh, maybe to the US or to Australia or to the, the Gulf states. Uh, she says it's just a dream, but it's a great dream. And this reminds me of a, an interesting paper by uh, Violetta Parutis, who's a Lithuanian sociologist at uh, I think the University of Essex, um, who has this notion in studying young Lith Lithuanian migrants in London of, 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 of a sort of sequence of first the migrant takes any job, then they look for a better job, and thirdly, they have their dream job. So this is the sequence, any job, a better job, and a dream job. Of course, not everybody gets to their dream job, but it's an interesting sequence. Also to kind of, um, yeah, to kind of unpack this, this problematic distinction between low skilled and higher skilled. You know, the, the migrants are not dichotomized in that way. They make progress. There's this notion of the learning migrant and the developing migrant. And, this, um, this schema of Perutis I think, is quite interesting in, in, that, in that regard. Okay, the, the other part of our analysis looks at tactics of belonging, and we break this down into uh, three, uh, three elements, everyday political reflections, uh, work and residence, and then uh, finally citizenship. Um, so uh, here's uh, a rather long uh, quote. I mean, the, I put these rather long quotes in with the idea of building up uh, the, the written paper, uh, obviously it's not terribly suitable for presentation to, to, to skim through, but um, you know, here we have, uh, if you can just kind of skim through this quote while I'm kind of gently burbling along, then you can maybe uh, get the, 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 the key phrases uh, from it. Um, but you know, these, these series of quotes which I'm going through now are examples of quite sophisticated readings of the evolving political situation. And being themselves very critical uh, of uh, an impending decision which um, everybody seems to see as certainly not in their own interests as migrants but also not uh, not in, in, in Britain's interest either um, so you can see the highlight here you know if you live here pay taxes study do a job nobody will throw you out because they need you uh, if on the other hand you are the undeserving migrant you know, if you're unemployed, on the street, homeless, then you'll be uh, deported uh, anyway. But on the other hand, you know, nobody is going to deport hundreds of thousands of uh, Eastern European migrants. You know, it's bullshit, it, it's nonsense. Uh, people pay taxes and throwing them out will be the same thing as putting your hand in your pocket, opening your wallet and throwing away your money. It will not happen here. Um, so I live here, I pay my bills, the country cannot simply throw me out. I mean, that's a kind of belief which is quite quite kind of widespread, constructing this notion of the economically valuable uh, deserving migrant. And then, yeah, the same thing from this, uh, th these two further uh, quotes there. The Brits at the bottom there, uh, I have the hope that the Brits will not vote for something that, will be, that would do no good to neither them uh, nor us. There are other examples here in here of, of how, you know, London uh, either in this quote or in the previous one, of how London is kind of par excellence, you know, the European city. It's going back to Adrian's, both Adrian's uh, book uh, on Eurostars and Eurocities and also some of the things that he said uh, earlier this morning. Um, these migrants realise that London has become both a national capital as well as a global capital, but also very much a European capital. Um, you know, so why on earth would uh, Britain vote to leave uh, Europe given that, uh, given that situation. And then uh, the second part of the, uh, the tactics, uh, the tactics of belonging uh, line of analysis looks at um, residence studies uh, and work. Um, here kind of looking at the sort of wait and see passive kind of resistance, uh, maybe to some extent strengthening roots, so looking, looking to the possibility of, of, of buying a flat, although of course in London that's extremely uh, challenging, although at the moment the, the, the market for property and the, the rental market is kind of frozen in, in, the, in the anticipation of what's, what's happening, so there is a, a minor sort of downturn in prices and rents uh, uh, at the moment. 
Um, the other thing is to look at uh, residence uh, and citizenship, which, uh, which I'm going to look at in a bit more detail in the next slide, but there's a couple of references to it here, so these slides are a little mixed up. Uh, but the second quote here is, is the only thing I'm thinking about is to get the resident status. Quite a lot of our interviewees talked about this five-year kind of residence card, which was a, a bit of a new thing to me. I had to go onto the Home Office website to check out exactly what it is, but it seems to be uh, a residence card which is offered to people who've been in the country for a certain amount of time uh, and who are somehow linked to uh, family-wise or, or marriage-wise to another person who is from the EU or European Economic Area and it gives a certain uh, interim status which can then become a sort of indefinite status and uh, uh, according to this interviewee it costs £50, it now costs according to the website £65 so it's uh, gone up in, in the few months since we did this interview uh, but it's seen as an option for those that cannot move towards citizenship uh, which of course is expensive, that costs a thousand pounds and also for Latvians who have the possibility of dual citizenship then that's another, uh, that's another option uh, as well because the, uh, the next, one of the next uh, quotes, the middle one of this quote, we have a, cu a couple here, Carlis and Alisa uh, who have actually activated their dual citizenship and have taken, taken British citizenship alongside Latvia but of course not, not all other European countries allow this dual citizenship option. Slovakia, for example, doesn't, which is one of the other groups that we have, uh, that we have, uh, that we, that we have that we're studying. So uh, very much this kind of open-endedness, but I mean, my final quote here is, is one which is rather more definitive and, and does, in a sense, sort of illustrate this, I suppose, this, this phrase that I threw out in one of the questions this morning about nothing so permanent as temporary migration. So uh, Irina, who came to the UK nine years ago has become a citizen uh, who feels British uh, and you know who in insists that she belongs here in London. I absolutely love London. This is pretty much where I'm going to stay. Um, and she reacts uh, negatively to the that, that question, which of course, if you are a foreigner and have an accident, have a, have an accent, you're almost always asked, you know, where do you come from? And uh, she says, I hate that question. Uh, my home is here. I have never seen Latvia as my as my home. So, um, just to wrap up, then uh, a couple of uh, conclusions. Um, particularly those East European migrants uh, who are graduates and, and highly skilled um, are seemingly highly politically conscious and closely follow, follow the ongoing debate. I should mention here that I mean some of the some of the unskilled. Um, migrants that we interviewed, particularly those I think that came from Romania, were were working so hard and had no kind of no, not much knowledge of, of English. Maybe they'd arrived quite recently, but they were involved in, in 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 strictly manual work, and they were kind of pretty much outside the consciousness of the political debate that was going on. At least at the time that we interviewed them, uh, that they were interviewed some some months ago. Uh, so this conscious this political awareness is not necessarily widespread across. Uh, the whole spectrum, but it is amongst the, the graduates and the highly skilled uh, and, the, and the students. Um, and so they're very much aware of, of Britain's changing place in Europe and, and globally, and they give highly insightful uh, and reflexive accounts uh, of these issues and the impacts that they will have uh, on themselves. But they're also equally critical of the paradox that they uh, observe um, that you know, they themselves are at the debate, uh, the centre of the debate on uncontrolled migration from the EU, but they, of course, are, are voiceless, um, and, and uh, 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 that's a situation which opens up broader questions about uh, participative democracy in the UK, and of course the, the other side of that coin is the, the situation that Michaela has been describing for, uh, for the British people in France and Spain uh, and, and so on. Um, but coming from Eastern Europe, they have a particular history, of course, um, which goes back through both their own experience, but particularly the experience of their, their parents and maybe even their grandparents, of a history of resilience and of radical political changes uh, in their own countries, uh, which you know, in the past very much restricted their mobility, um, but nowadays give them a kind of resilience which uh, I think gives them a certain self-confidence that they will survive whatever happens. I mean, that, that kind of came through quite strongly 
uh, in some of the narratives in a kind of implicit implicit way. And so they rely therefore on these tactics of endurance and waiting, uh, putting their trust in the market logic of their own economic um, uh, citizenship, the fact that they are all pretty much working or studying, they're earning an income, they're paying tax, and therefore they stress their economic citizenship uh, as, uh, as a way of, of kind of self-belief that they, 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 they can present themselves as good and trustworthy uh, residents and, uh, and therefore they are preparing tactically and, and in terms of their mindset to remain in the UK uh, whatever the referendum uh, results. Okay, I think I'm on time so I'll finish there. <laughs>